Good morning. In today's video, I will discuss Prime Minister Bajpayee's handling of national security, defense and external threats. We are aware that BJP has been in power two times, once during the tenure of Bajpayee and the Modi government now. And the BJP has consistently maintained that as far as national security and defense is concerned, they are exemplary, that is the unique selling point and they have always been better than the Congress governments. Let's test that. Now during Bajpayee's tenure, four big things happened, which I will discuss. Nuclear tests were done, Kargil conflict happened with Pakistan, Operation Parakram against Pakistan and in 2003, the Prime Minister paid an official visit to China, need to look at the outcome of that. Let's start with the nuclear test. On two days, 11th and 13th of May 1998, the Bajpayee government declared they have done five nuclear tests and India has become a nuclear weapon state. Well, it doesn't happen that way because what they had done on these two days were the big bangs. Now, from the big bang to making an actual device is a lot of distance patience that is required. You need amongst various things, you need a proper command and control. So that is where the Bajpayee government should have put the focus. Instead, what did the Prime Minister do? He wrote a confidential letter to the American President Bill Clinton explaining to him why India had done the nuclear tests, giving two reasons. One, he said, China is a nuclear weapon state and there is an increased illegal nexus between China and Pakistan on nuclear trade. Now, what exactly was the reason for writing this letter to the American president? Except that the BJP governments and Bajpayee was no exception. They always want to be seen very close to the American establishment. Therefore, we know that the Americans, they are the leaders of the non-proliferation regimes. They, they had to do by their law what they had to do. So, sanctions were imposed on the government and sadly, for Bajpayee. Clinton got furious. He leaked the letter to the press. And the Chinese also got to know the reason that they have been named as a key reason for India doing the nuclear tests. Not only that, within 40, 48 hours of this announcement that we are a nuclear weapon state, the then Deputy Prime Minister and Home Minister Lal Krishna Adwani told the media that now India has got nuclear weapons, so Pakistan needs to rethink on its Kashmir policy linking the two. So what did Pakistan do? There the Army Chief General Jahangir Karamat, on the 28th of May, he said that we have done six nuclear tests and now there is parity at the strategic level. As far as nuclear deterrence is concerned, it has been established. So. Next, what happened? As I said, Chinese were fu furious. So, their intrusions, incursions, infiltration on the line of actual control, the border that we have with China, that increased many fold. Next, the nexus, the nuclear nexus between China and Pakistan, it became more intense and more intertwined. With the result, that very soon the, um, the military ruler of Pakistan, General Musharraf, declared that Pakistan had acquired tactical nuclear weapons and Pakistan declared nuclear full spectrum capability, deterrence. That means, what this means is that all levels of war, at the strategic level, operational level, even at the tactical level, they said that it is not only a conventional war that India needs to fight, it is also a deterrence which has been created at the nuclear level. So even that is also to be kept in mind. It was a big thing because until now what used to happen is that we are aware that in 1974 under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, peaceful nuclear explosions were done. What that meant was nuclear weapons had come to Pakistan to sorry to India and Pakistan also followed suit. They also got the nuclear weapons, but they were kept in the closet. So the requirement of a deterrence at the nuclear level 
and urgency of an arms race was avoided by both sides. That means it was enough to fight a conventional war and just create a deterrence there or do an overmatch there. So now that responsibility or the liability had increased. If there was anybody sensible person in the Bajpayee government, that person should have realized that of course the sanctions will come, that is one part. The key part is they should have learned, I mean after all they claim to be very close to the American establishment. The key lesson of the American first offset strategy which was done by President Eisenhower in the 50s and that was that there is a need eventually when they were looking at the Soviets, they realized that first offset strategy which basically was about the Soviets had overwhelming superiority in conventional weapons so the tactical nuclear weapons were created but once the Soviets achieved parity in nuclear weapons at the tactical and strategic level then it had run its course, the first offset strategy and hence the Americans had to go to the second offset strategy. In other words, whenever nuclear weapons are introduced, irrespective of whether it's a no first use, first use, the fact of the matter is that in the case of India and Pakistan, where India has a no first use policy, Pakistan has not declared its nuclear policy, declaratory policy, but if you see their deployments, if you see their conventional capabilities, if you see the topography, it becomes very clear that with Lahore and Amritsar being 40 kilometers away and with huge densities and populations there, they will not, neither side will use tactical nuclear weapons, but a deterrence has to be created. So add a, a mindless second huge responsibility was created by the Bajpayee government by doing a nuclear test for the simple reason that it was on their checklist. It is on the BJP checklist that this had to be done and so it was done. The second event during Bajpayee tenure was the 1999 Kargil conflict. I call it conflict and not war, a reason I'll explain in a while. Now, the originator of this Kargil conflict was the Pakistan Army Chief General Musharraf. And what Musharraf wanted to do, which he has written in his book, The Line of Fire, was to avenge Siachen. Now, this was a senseless thing for the simple reason that Siachen happened on no man's land. And what he was trying to do was on a very critical land where India had no choice but to fight and fight hard and they fought. So, Musharraf's plan was based on two fundamentals. One, there was a huge gap in Kargil sector, a gap of about 120 kilometers, because there the heights are between 15,000 to 18,000 feet. It's all snowbound. So in the winter months, the Indian army did not occupy them, came back in the summer months. They used to go there, make the post there, occupy the post and do ground patrolling. This was a routine which was known to the Pakistani side. The second fundamental was that the line of control which was drawn after the 1972 Shimla agreement, it was done on small scale maps. Now when you see the large scale map, according to the modern survey facility, that same line can be interpreted anything between 2 kilometers to 10 kilometers wide. So he took recourse in the fact that look technically we are still on the line of control and the plan was that ahead well inside Indian territories the Mujahids infiltration used to happen. So the Mujahids whom they call the freedom fighters and we call terrorists they were there. They were to be supported. They were to be supported because in the entire winter of 1989-99 the Northern Light Infantry, which was then the paramilitary force of the Pakistanis, they were ordered to dig in and occupy those areas because those winter months, the Indians were not there. There was the gap. And Indians were completely oblivious of what they were doing the entire winter. And having this forward, uh, forward defenses, the NLI or the Northern Light Infantry was to provide firepower to the Mujahids and do what the whole idea was to disrupt 
the key artillery artery national highway 1 which connects shrinagar to leh now this obviously would be unacceptable to the indian side they will never allow leh to be cut off from shrinagar and this would also affect siachen so this was the plan of musharraf now it was a plan it was a gamble because he didn't even inform his army he didn't inform his air force he didn't inform his navy because it had to be kept secret so only a limited leadership of the pakistan army was in the know of this plan that this is to be done so what happened indians were not aware because for the last 9 years since 1990 the indian army has been doing counter terror operation where the requirement is that you are looking at infiltrators so you're looking down you're looking at the valleys you're looking at the rivers you're not looking at the mountain tops where now the nli had dug up and they were in defenses there so finally on the 6th of may 1999 it was found out that yes some places have been dug in and the pakistanis are there then 15 core commander because at that time this whole area was the responsibility of 15 core uh, which has headquarters in shrinagar lieutenant general kishan pass was asked that what is this and he said oh it's a routine infiltration he told this at the unified headquarters in shrinagar and we will clear it because he didn't know there was no intelligence at that stage so based on what he said the senior army officer the then defense minister george fernandez also told the media that in 48 hours we'll throw this infiltrators out it never happened that way slowly slowly then the reality dawned what was going on and still trying to keep everything secret the indian army leadership the vice chief then chandrashekar lieutenant general he told the chief general bp malik who was an official told to poland that sir you stay there we'll handle it it's nothing much it was much it was a big thing so when he said we'll handle it what he did was lot of units were sent in initially it was all ad hoc because how we know this because bp malik has written in his book kargil from surprise to victory he writes that lot of ad hoc units without combat strength without logistics they were just inducted in and lot of casualties came of the total dead on the indian side we had some 526 dead 1363 wounded these are the official figures maximum deaths happened in this time and if i may digress to say after the conflict there should have been a national commission and the army chief and the entire leadership they should have been hauled up and they should have been answerable how these deaths happened and how there was a total failure of tactical intelligence but it didn't happen so chandrashekar the vice chief he got in touch with the air force now behind the back of the government he wanted the air force to help them the army with their gunships with their attack helicopters so that they could or remove the occupier still exactly how many were there where they were dug in the details were still not known and all this was going on and the then air force chief air chief marshal tipness he refused he says if you want to use air power then the government has to be in the loop we know what he did because tipness wrote the only exclusive account of his war the air force war called operation safed sagar in the force magazine and mind you the air force operation safed sagar was very different from the army operation which was called operation vijay but that is another story so coming back to where we are were on the 25th of may finally the the government took uh, charge of the situation the commanders conference was called on the 25th and the go ahead was given by the bajpai government to the air force to join the game with two terms of reference one that the air force will not cross the line of control with pakistan it will stay on our side and two 
all action or all operations have to happen in a limited space of Kargil. We will not expand the war. So after that, what, what Malik did, the army chief, he gambled. No chief should gamble like this. And he did. He brought something like 900 artillery guns. Because we know after the war, it was the artillery that really won the whole thing and not the Air Force. Because even Air Force was not prepared for the operations in high altitude. They did a lot of innovation. But the real killer was the artillery. So the artillery of the strike cause was denuded. A huge gap was created there. 900 guns, including 100 guns, which the BJP people had discredited Bafo's gun and which gave a very good account of themselves. They were brought in the theatre and most of them were put in a direct firing role. I mean, this was not a war. This was a conflict. So that is what was done. And Malik conceded, the army chief conceded, he writes in the book that we were short of weapons, short of equipment, short of transport, short of oil, lubricants, ammunition, spares, short of everything. He writes there. Why? Nobody has asked him. Because from 1990 to 1999, you were only focused on counter-terror operations and all chiefs, why Malik? All chiefs consistently when they are asked, they say, we are ready to fight. But you weren't ready here. Now, so what happened was that as far as Musharraf was concerned, Musharraf writes in his book, he was very clear. He says that the artillery was denuded. Four divisions, he writes in the book, four divisions of the Indian Army were brought in that limited space against five odd regiments of my NLI, Northern Light Infantry. And Musharraf, we know when the conflict started, he was sitting in Beijing. He was in China to get a assured operational support from the Chinese which they had given. Not only that, the Chinese also promised and they delivered. They did aggressive patrolling on the line of control with India as a consequence of which properly acclimatized troops, the Indian troops on the Chinese border, for example, the 114 Brigade in Gumti, it could not be brought to the Pakistani theatre because of the aggressive patrolling. So this is how the cooperation happened between these two, Pakistan and China. Now, as far as Musharraf was concerned, he was looking for operational support. He was determined to fight. But then two things happened which saved the day. One, on the 16th of June, India's National Security Advisor Brijesh Mishra met with his American counterpart Sandy Berger in Europe and told him that, look, things are out of control. And Sandy Berger then informed his establishment that a delegation went and met Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif of Pakistan. Nawaz Sharif simply threw in the towel, he gave in and on 4th of July, Nawaz Sharif was in Washington DC with the President, American President Clinton and where he agreed that yes, we will withdraw and the Pakistanis withdrew. Now, so it is Nawaz Sharif who gave in and not Musharraf, that points need to be kept in mind. Now, what happened after the conflict? After the conflict, I'll tell you what happened and what should have happened. So what happened was that a new 14 core was raised. The lesson was learned that we cannot have this disruption. So there should be an independent core now. It cannot, the lay, that entire Ladakh area cannot be under 15 core. So 14 core was raised. Number two, the burden of having our troops round the year in that high altitude conditions in Kargil, that gap was to be filled. So we filled that gap now. Then what we should have done is the army chief should have recommended or the defense minister, if we had good defense ministers, they should have said, guys, just get out of this CI ops and focus on war. Because if you are focused on war, you are not looking down, you are looking up you are looking at the heights, there would not have been a tactical intelligence failure. And unfortunately, instead of building up a credible conventional war capability, the Bajpai government cleared 
raising of 30 new rashtra rifle units this is what happened so i think no lesson was learned either by the political leadership and especially by the indian army indian army instead of i i want to repeat that because this again thing came up in operation parakram instead of working towards credible conventional war capability by slowly giving away uh, their counter terror role they got more and more into the quagmire of counter terror terror fighting counter terror by raising new units the next event under the bajpayee government was operation parakram which was a 10 month military standoff between india and pakistan the indian military called it operation parakram when you use the word operation it means that you are mobilizing for either war or for a conflict as was the case with kargil conflict that was called operation vijay on the other side the pakistani leadership perhaps had a premonition that this will not become a war and the same event they called twin peak crisis because in the 10 months the whole thing peaked two times now looking at the genesis of operation parakram it all started with 9 11 when president bush declared global war on terror now inspired by that when there was an attack a terrorist attack on 1st of october 2001 on the jammu and kashmir assembly Prime Minister Bajpai publicly warned Pakistan that if there is another attack, it will be dealt with severely. Therefore, when on the 13th of December 2001, terrorists they struck the Indian parliament when the parliament was in session, the Prime Minister was left with no choice but to take action. Certain demands were put on Musharraf, the Pakistani ruler, which he rejected outrightly. Therefore, on the 17th of December, the Cabinet Committee on Security met under the Prime Minister and on the 18th of December 2001, the Prime Minister, his National Security Advisor, Brijesh Mishra, met the three service chiefs and told them to mobilize for war. Because the army was to take the maximum time for mobilization and the army chief who also happened to be the chairman chiefs of staff committee general s padmanabhan he asked the political leadership what is the war objective we are mobilizing what is it that needs to be accomplished he was told we'll let you know later now here was the army chief who was willing who was ready to mobilize without knowing what he was supposed to accomplish Please compare this with my last video where I spoke of the 1971 war. There was a to and fro interaction between Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and General Sam Manik Shaw. So this was the state of the military leadership today. Uh, today is at the time of Operation Parakram. They had come down so many notches. So uh, the mobilization was ordered on the 18th of December 2001. This was the biggest mobilization of the Indian Army after the 1971 war. Not only it was happening for the first time, it was also a larger mobilization because more units, more equipment had been added in the Indian Army. So the rolling stocks were there, the civilian trains were cancelled, there was sufficient confusion in the country. And after two weeks, it was on the 6th of January 2002 that the Indian Army was ready, it was mobilized. In the meantime, perhaps on the urging of the Indian government, President Bush spoke with President Musharraf of Pakistan. And Musharraf also had a problem at that time because everything was happening so suddenly that two of his divisions, which had a role, which were in Afghanistan, which had a role on the eastern side against India, which had a rule against India, were involved in Operation Enduring Freedom, which was the American War on Terror. They had to be pulled back. So Musharraf publicly said that he will not allow his soil to be used by terrorists against India, against any foreign country. He said that and that was enough, it appears, for the time being to pacify the Indian government. Now nothing was heard, so 
the army chief on the 11th of january publicly he met the press and he said that the army is ready for war it is now waiting for the orders as far as the army was concerned army had mobilized for war please keep this in mind now nothing happened so the army leadership said told all the forces to dig in and to build the defenses and stay there then the next crisis happened now by this time musharraf was ready he had already pulled his troop he had done the mobilization and because they work on interior lines of communication they could mobilize faster than the indian side so on 14th of may once again the terrorists struck this time in kaluchak on a air force camp where they killed 30 women and children well enough was enough the army chief publicly said that something needs to be done and the prime minister sensing the mood of the nation and with his usual poetic flourish he said ab aar paar ki ladai hogi what me- what he meant was that now it is a war to finish the westerners took it very seriously because when the prime minister says war to the finish and both the uh, the two sides they have nuclear weapons that means there is a problem so the advisories were issued by all western countries to their citizens to leave the country there was total panic now vijesh mishra realizing who was the national security advisor how serious the thing is he called up his counterpart nsa condolisa rice in america we know that because rice has written in a book in an autobiography no higher honors that vijesh mishra called me pulled me out from a important meeting of the principals and said you do something because i cannot do much here to stop the war so now the americans again were called in to stop the war to do something we do not know what they did but the long and short is nothing happened on the indian side and the pakistani side now it was a question of how do we demobilize without losing face for the indian side so on the 16th of october after 10 months 16th october 2002 a meeting was called of the national security advisory board where the chairman of the board at that time was general vp malik and vp malik suggested that operation parakram needs to do strategic restructuring because all the objectives have been met whatever that meant and immediately the demobilization was ordered now let's see what happened what happened is that in parliament after that the defense minister said that all our objectives have been met and the biggest objective was that pakistan has been coerced the whole idea of this operation was coercion now the government said in parliament whereas this was not what the army chief thought it was and in this coercion part the official figures were given were 798 soldiers dead 8000 crores spent the whole crop this was the crop season in punjab because the tanks and all these armored vehicles were there it was all damaged compensation had to be paid for that there was heavy wear and tear of 10 months of the equipment so that was there and vk singh vk singh who later became now is the minister in the government of uh, uh, modi and he was the army chief at that time he was a brigadier he was a brigadier in 11 corps in a holding corps in jalandhar he has written a book which is which the title is courage and conviction he writes that there was inside the army it was good that it was not put to test because the army was not ready he writes that the northern command the northern command chief told the chief army chief that i need more time for mobilization i need spares i need to do reorientation i need more ammunition basically it was counter terror operation which had taken a toll on the indian army northern command they were not prepared now as far as the holding corps where he was a brigadier he writes that what was happening there is because nothing had been trained no real training had happened ever 
so all these mines when you take the defenses you dig the mines there you put the mines there now the mines were not fitting the fuses were not fitting so the soldiers were trying their you know strength putting it and they were all get all bursting she says that it was painful to see so many soldiers die there we all felt helpless because the mines had to be put but they had not been tested they were perhaps dated so this was the state of the indian army and hence the official figure is 798 dead but the people who were there and who have written the book have put a figure of 2000 plus dead this is the date what was accomplished lessons learned let's come to that number 1 pakistan was not coerced next india's conventional capabilities were totally blunted by this operation when you said that you will go to war or the army thought they were going to war and they just came back so that was blunted now when your conventional capabilities are blunted and your coercion fails there is something else that happens because not only has your con- your coercion failed with your adversary there are other adversaries who are noticing that which means that when you have to now build up your credibility of your conventional war you have to double up to convince not only this adversary but the other adversaries also then as i said there was a loss of life without a shot being fired money was spent massive wear and tear of equipment considering that most of the spare parts assemblies india imports it does not make them so it was a huge burden next there was a total disconnect between the political and the military leadership what the military leadership was thinking was not conveyed to the political leadership next the military leadership never asked what are the war objectives how do you mobilize without the war objectives next any sensible thing that needed to be done now was to prepare for your conventional you prepare your conventional war capabilities instead what was done immediately after this the next army chief was general nc witch and in 2004 he did operation fence he built a fence which was called operation dewar along the line of control that means counter terror operations will continue next the bajpayee government showed both as far as kargil was concerned and this was concerned that us support was indispensable to defuse the crisis they were simply not capable of doing things of their on their own which was not the case in the, in 1971 and the same thing when i'll make a video on the modi government we will see that the americans once again came in the game because the indian side was unable to stand up to the chinese the pla next one big lesson of that war was sustenance operational sustenance massive wear and tear please build up your indigenous industry now 20 years later the cds anil chohan is asked that what are the lessons of the ukraine war and he says one single lesson that comes out is that we should be we should have our own indigenous capability god that should have been known long ago what is this lesson now that we are learning 20 years late next for the first time the bajpai government when they went to the election after the kargil war the pictures of because they declared kargil as a victory it was declared as a victory therefore the army chief's picture the pictures of the other heroes of kargil it was there on the election poster they just integrated for their help in the elections the indian military something that had never happened before and of course the modi government now has gone many many steps ahead we will discuss that next they were smart enough bajpai was the first uh, prime minister to understand the importance of integrating the military with the political leadership and hence for the first time it was in bajpai's tenure that a defense cell was created and general jacob he was made the head of the defense cell i asked the general i said what are you doing there he says well the congress never gave me much respect they've asked me to do this i'm happy doing it so 
Now, this is so in a nutshell, what did we gain? We just lost as far as Parakram is concerned. Now, there is a related question here before I go to my next event of Bajpayee government and that is a lot of people have said, asked about 2611 when the Mumbai terror attack happened in 2008, why the Manmohan Singh government did not uh, retaliate, why it did not mobilize for war? Well, two big reasons. Reason number one. The massive wear and tear that happened there would not have been done with or it would not have been filled in six years time considering that the Indian army was still busy doing counter-terror operations. So wear and tear, the availability of the equipment was a big point. And the second point was the defense minister of the Manmohan Singh government which is A.K. Anthony. Anthony has been the longest serving defense minister since post-independent India. He became the defense minister in 2006 and was till the end of the tenure of the Manmohan Singh government. Now he had so much of time to pull the army out of CI ops, counter-terror ops, despite the fact that the home minister Chidambaram and the chief minister at that time, the chief minister of Jammu and Kashmir, Omar Abdullah, publicly said that we need to remove Armed Forces Special Powers Act from Jammu and Kashmir. Now, if you remove that, then you you pull out the counter terror, the army from the CI ops. He didn't do it. Why? Because the army chiefs advised him not to do it because they had a comfort there. The point I'm making is very simple: that unless a defense minister will not take ownership of his job, there will always be trouble because the services will always look for what is good for them, what is the comfort zone for them and having done CI Ops since 1990, obviously this is the comfort zone for them. Now the last important thing that happened during Bajpayee's tenure was the official visit of Prime Minister Bajpayee in 2003 to China. Before I talk of the visit, a bit of a background is necessary. Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi was the first Prime Minister after the 1962 war to visit China. Thereafter, there has been a lot of pressure in the Prime Minister's office that all subsequent Prime Ministers visit should be seen as better than that of their predecessor. Because so much of importance is given to an event, unlike the Chinese who give importance to a process as to how India and China relations are going. In India, it is not so. Immediately, something big has to be shown, has been accomplished. And therefore, a lot of mistakes are made. Narsimha Rao made one mistake where he accepted that the border was the line of actual control. And that changed the dynamic, something that I have discussed in my other videos. Now, as far as Bajpayee was concerned, it was formally accepted during his visit that Tibet Autonomous Region is part of People's Republic of China. And in return, the Chinese promised that they will accept that Sikkim is a part of India, but formally they never said this. Now, what India accepted is significant because until the visit of Bajpayee, the position of Indians was that Tibet is autonomous region of China. Now, when we say Tibet, we are talking of a big Tibet. We are talking of a Tibet of Dalai Lama, where it had a lot of provinces. When you say Tibet Autonomous Region, it's a very small area. Because so many promises, provinces which were there in Tibet, they, the Chinese, have amalgamated with their adjacent provinces. They are no longer part of Tar. By accepting that Tar is part of People's Republic of China, A, it means that you are saying it is no longer autonomous, which is the position that was held earlier by all the uh, Prime Ministers and by the Government of India. And then you are also denying the Tibet card to the Dalai Lama because Tar is smaller. But these nuances, which all the diplomats understand, were not really understood by the people at large. Therefore, in 2009, 
after this happened in 2009 for the first time though the chinese had always held this position but they publicly said that arunachal pradesh is south tibet and it is part of tibet that is where this whole thing of south tibet started so i have given the five uh, big events under the bajpayee government uh, so now the viewer can decide for himself or herself as to really if the bjp government has been strong on national security and defense of india thank you